At first glance, the question this video asks of whether or not music composition and art as a whole is creative may seem a bit odd. After all, you are by definition creating, right? Well, music composition tends to have a lot more to it than just the act of coming up with sound, just like painting and poetry and any other art form involve all sorts of external processes. Things like planning, structure, distribution, even learning, and a multitude of other things that don't normally come to mind when we think of these art forms. Things that I would argue tend to not be very creative at all because we accept them as the structures that our art forms exist in and instances of art that innovate in those particular areas tend to be considered outliers and exceptional. So how do these things impact the world of music composition, and why is this something even worth pondering? For me, the balance of creative and, um, uncreative processes that are involved in composing have really become quite interesting to consider. This balance of things and my apparent discomfort with upsetting that balance has enormously shaped the compositional process of my second symphony, which is a story I'd like to share later on in this video. But before that, what are these ambiguous, uncreative aspects of composition that I'm referring to? Well, let's first take a look at how creativity is defined. Merriam-Webster defines creativity as the ability to create and the quality of being creative. Oh. Okay, then what does it mean to be creative? The first definition is nearly identical, but the second one is a little bit more specific. Having the quality of something created rather than imitated. Fascinating. Okay, so let's just go with that dichotomy for now. What are the parts of the composition process that tend to fall into the imitated category rather than created? I think it generally falls into a few larger categories of things. The first is things pertaining directly to how we compose, things like instrumentation, musical structure, in many cases music theory, and the stylistic tropes that we inherit from composers who came before us. Now, before I start talking about this, I want to make it very clear that I in no way intend to draw creativity versus a lack thereof into being inherently good or bad. Of course, both are necessary in order to have this art form as we know it, and many other art forms as we know them. I just have really been fascinated with the idea of diving into the non-creative parts of composition, as well as instances in which they can be made to be creative, so with that out of the way, let's talk about instrumentation. And with regards to instrumentation, of course we're not typically inventing the instruments that are to be played in our pieces. Instances in which the composers are doing that would be considered to be absolute outliers. In addition to that, composers need to know how to write effectively for the different instruments in order to avoid writing something awkward or even unplayable, which, don't get me wrong, I definitely think is to the benefit of the art form. We also tend to have limited scope in terms of what instruments we choose to be part of our works. The fear that a piece might get played significantly less because of unusual instrumentation is an enormous motive to keep composers from being creative in how they choose their instruments. I know that whenever I start putting music into Sibelius and it's for an orchestra piece, I always throw down the two flutes, two oboes, two clarinets, two bassoons, etc., with the only creativity there being whether or not I want to include auxiliaries like the piccolo or English horn, and if so, which ones. Now, obviously, there are exceptions to this. I think well known composers tend to be more comfortable with experimentation in their instrumentation because their fear of a work being played less is not quite as prevalent. There are also instances in which a composer has an overwhelming fascination with a certain instrument or combination of instruments, and they're so enamored with it that they don't care whether or not the piece gets performed. But despite some of these exceptions, I think Western classical music does a particularly bad job at fostering creativity in this particular area. And I understand why. If I were to approach a local orchestra and ask them to play my symphony and it called for six alto flutes, serpent, and harpsichord, I of course would be turned away, not because the creativity or the music is necessarily bad, but because experimentation in instrumentation is huge cause for monetary concern for large ensembles. I I can't even ask the timpanist to whack a bass drum during a long multi-rest without risk. However, I do think the resurgence of smaller groups in spite of large orchestras in recent years has offered some promising opportunities for instrumentation to continue to be experimented with. This is something I'll speak about at length when I tell my story of how these ideas came to drastically shape a recent piece of mine, so I'll keep this a bit more brief. I remember when starting to compose that I had this obsession with all of these different types of structures in Western music. The prelude, the fugue, the symphony, the nocturne, the sonata, the string quartet. Discovering these words and what they meant and that they could be numbered into neat little groups of pieces was just so satisfying to my brain. Then implications of certain things start to arise and be imprinted. The ninth symphony is the biggest and most grandiose of all. Prelude can exist alongside fugues or by themselves, but they're usually not put into multi-movement structures. Oops. Sonatas have three movements unless they have four, and in both instances there are prescribed tempi for each movement. I absolutely revered these ideas as a teenager, and while they are very satisfying and nice guidelines to learn about, especially as someone who's very much on the autism spectrum, they always were to the detriment of my music, because my reverence for these strict forms as something that could help me write music didn't allow me to imagine music in forms that would actually serve the music that I was writing. While I still 
still very much appreciate the value that some of these structures have for my music, I think in recognizing them as nothing more than they are, structures in which a lot of composers wrote hundreds of years ago, I have been set free from my imagined grip that they had on my creativity, which brings me to... Oh dear God, it's the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. I always feel kind of sad when someone asks me whether or not they need to know a lot of music theory in order to be a composer. And for anyone out there wondering, the short answer is no, absolutely not. The slightly longer answer is that it depends both on what you mean by the term music theory and what kind of composer you want to be, what kind of music you want to write. If by music theory you mean the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians, the answer to most composers position curious people is no, unless of course you'd like to write in the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. It's a real shame that music theory hasn't developed in a more globalized fashion, and I won't go on that whole tirade right now because that's a subject that deserves an entire video of its own, but this is one of the most poignant instances of creativity and composition, and particularly in young composers, being completely extinguished. My music was a huge victim of this when I was learning to compose because I literally thought that music theory was a set of rules for composing, which is really unfortunate and backwards. Words. This is one of the few instances in which I think the non-creative process here is vastly detrimental to the composition process as a whole, so I would be remiss not to include it, but again, I don't want to talk about this for too long. If you'd like to hear more on this subject, I would absolutely check out Adam Neely's video, Music Theory and White Supremacy. It's a long one, but absolutely worth the time of anyone in this field. Also, to end this part on a note of optimism, there are amazing educators on YouTube and around the world whose pedagogy with relation to theory absolutely flies in the face of how theory has typically been taught. Some of my favorites on YouTube have been 8-Bit Music Theory, who delves into the music of video games and what we can learn from it, JJ Berthume, who has multiple videos, particularly on harmony, that completely changed the way I viewed theory as a teenager, and Nare Sol, whose videos explore not only an array of styles and genres and how she engages with them, but also a much broader spectrum of composers than you'd normally learn about in your everyday theory class. Speaking of style and composers, let's talk about... Obviously, the existence of music makes it pretty difficult to write music without being influenced by anything. I'm not even sure why you'd want to do that unless you were trying to invent a style completely unlike anything anyone's ever heard before, and again, that's no small task. One instance of stylistic innovation that keeps coming to mind is Schoenberg's serialism, a compositional style in which each of the 12 notes in the Western chromatic scale must be used up before repeating any notes. Each of these sets of 12 notes can then be mathematically manipulated by reversing them or flipping them upside down, and you can serialize things other than pitch too, by assigning certain numerical values to different rhythms, ranges, or even timbres, and the result sounds something like this. Yeah, it's not for everyone. But what's interesting to me is that this innovation, while ironically very creative in its own existence while simultaneously forcing composers to be even more creative in how they deal with its rules, even this innovation cannot claim to be entirely 100% an innovation. By nature, it has 12 notes, which most Western music does, so that's not very creative. And almost all of the executions of this style take advantage of instruments that already exist. Wow, how unimaginative. I think my point is clear that even though we have these intensely creative and innovative moments throughout music history pertaining to style and how composers can shape the course of that, no single instance in history can completely be separated from what came before. And I think there are many times when a composer will do something like this, where they throw most of the rules out the window in an attempt to make something new, that shine really quite brightly. And this kind of thing is happening every day, and even though most of these things don't necessarily catch on and start a new chapter in music history, it is really cool to see this kind of experimentation happening with much more frequency than at any other time in history. So all of these things pertain directly to the composition process and how we often learn and abide by the restrictions of the system that we exist in. But there are other elements of composition that tend to be even more objective. These tend to be common post-compositional tasks, things like engraving, performing, and performance mediums, as well as things like recording and distribution. Most of these are logistical concerns. With engraving, which is the art of music notation, meaning what literally goes on the page, the goal is to communicate in the most effective way possible to the performer what it is they're meant to do in order to perform the piece. This is largely an objective practice 
this with some sheet music being considered objectively bad or objectively good. Now, what about music that goes beyond the conventions that standard music notation allows? Things like aleatory come to mind, a practice in which the performer is meant to carry out a certain musical idea, but beyond the way we normally think of time structures in music. So when measures suddenly mean nothing but only for specific periods of time, how do we convey that on a score? And the solution was box notation, where the musical idea to be carried out arrhythmically is put in a box, and then a nice little arrow comes out of it, showing how long it's meant to happen. This can reference bar numbers or simply be durations of time, like in my piece, Three Colorado Snowscapes. So there's an instance of music engraving being an innovative and creative practice rather than a purely objective one. The examples throughout European musical history are fairly subtle, but you will notice a gradual change in the way that sheet music from the 1600s looks to the sheet music of, say, the 1940s. Again, in the late 20th and 21st centuries, we start to see a lot more experimentation with this kind of thing, where notation becomes much more a part of the creative side of the composition process with all sorts of interesting looking things that are meant to be interpreted as, well, sheet music. There's also, of course, an incredible amount of music that doesn't use sheet music at all, and therefore this practice of music engraving means nothing. I would say that because of this, I'd also like to think that it'd be considered creative for a composer to breach those boundaries according to their genre, meaning the decision of composers who come from a genre that typically uses sheet music to not use it, or vice versa. Speaking for myself, I know that the restriction of a score or just opening up a document in Sibelius or Darko can feel suffocating, and there are many times when the involvement of the notation in the compositional process can actually prevent me from coming up with ideas. Performing is an interesting one because it relates to how musicians connect with their audiences. I think this is a particularly important one for us classical musicians to take our heads out of the sand for, because the way we do concerts and share the music that we like is simply not sustainable. It doesn't connect with the vast majority of young people, which I think is a real shame because I think there's a significant amount that can be loved by everyone. Now, this topic obviously goes beyond the bounds of simply music composition, but I think it's important for a composer to consider how they might want a piece they're writing to be performed, and if there's a creative way that they can do that, that potentially attracts a little bit of a different audience. Now, not to pat myself on the back here, but I've recently found a passion for my virtual ensemble, the Dad Village Symphony Orchestra, or DVSO if you don't have much time. When COVID shut down my school in mid-March of 2020, I immediately began contacting people to see if they'd like to remotely record parts to my symphony number one, and it turns out they did. So I painstakingly put this thing together in logic over the course of about four months, knowing next to nothing about audio engineering. I then put the video together in DaVinci Resolve and premiered the piece as a YouTube premiere, which held about 80 audience members during the premiere and shortly after rose far above a thousand views, which is a lot for my channel. Now, seeing the success that I had with that type of unconventional performance, I went ahead and did another one in spring of 2021 called Biomes. Now, this was a series of nature-inspired works by myself, JJ Berthume, Samuel Coleridge-Taylor, and Lily Boulanger, whose piano works were orchestrated by several other living composers. And literally at the time of recording this video, I'm also gearing up to do our third performance. And all of these are hosted on this channel, by the way, if you'd like to check them out. So anyway, I'll stop praising myself for the time being, but I wanted to acknowledge that because I thought that YouTube was a performance medium that a lot of people actually really appreciated. And speaking of YouTube, what a great place to hear music. Perhaps some don't consider it performance to just upload a video of your music, but for a lot of people, that's the best shot they have at reaching a wider audience, and I think that that's fantastic. I discovered probably the majority of my favorite music on YouTube, and even if some of that is just a no performer rendition of someone's piece, at least we have the opportunity to get an idea of what someone's music sounds like and decide whether or not we're interested. I know that I listened to J.J. Berthume's Symphony Number. No. One on a fairly regular basis, and it is literally just a note performer mock up. But the first movement has nearly 20,000 views, so who's anyone to say that that's not an effective way to share music? Another platform that's great for creative performance is Twitch. Many people consider the platform to be mainly for video games, but there's all kinds of art that gets shared on Twitch. One of my old colleagues, Justin Carter, plays music for hundreds of people every day on Twitch and makes all of these different tracks live on stream, and he regularly gets on Twitch's front page. What a creative and wonderful way to not only perform but also compose. Again, a lot of this goes beyond the scope of just composition, but I wanted to talk about this because I think we composers have more power to get our works performed than we realize. If that means emailing 50 people and asking them to record your symphony remotely, then so be it. If it looks like sharing a MIDI file on social media, or sharing a video of a live performance, or literally picking up an instrument or laptop and going out and playing your stuff on the street, then that's awesome too. Performance is an area of classical music that, again, I think desperately needs attention in terms of creativity, and it's really encouraging to see the attention that composers have recently been giving to it. I also mentioned recording and 
and distribution as part of the post-compositional tasks, but I think I covered large swaths of those in tandem with talking about performance in general, so I won't go to at length here. All I'll say is that if you want to be creative in the way that you record and distribute things, I would definitely advise thinking on that stuff just as much as you think about writing music. This could mean developing music technology skills, building an audience on a social media platform, or getting some instrumental chops so that you can maintain agency over how your music gets to people. I'll also say that these skills will in turn foster creativity in these specific areas. The more you know about something, the more you'll want to experiment with it. Okay, and then the third category, which I would probably say contains the most uncreative compositional processes. These are situations in which you have to compose even if you're not really feeling it. Now, the two main instances I thought of for this were the things that I've most frequently experienced myself in this vein, and those are instances in which you either need to have written enough music to justify weekly lessons with your teacher, sorry, and meeting commission deadlines. Now, sometimes you just have to write music. It doesn't matter what you want or how you feel, you're going to let someone down if you don't write music. And sometimes the consequences of this can be just a sort of awkward email to your teacher saying that you don't want to waste their time. But in other instances, the consequences can be that you either don't get your music performed or you don't get paid. And writing music in these instances where you absolutely have no will to finish the work, but you just simply need to, just really sucks. They're some of the least creative, and this time I actually mean it in a bad way, and draining and frustrating times you can go through as a composer. What really stings is when you can't come up with anything you like, but you have four hours to engrave the score in parts, so you just need to write some music that you don't even like. It's obviously really unfortunate when creators are put in those positions where they have to be entirely objective, even about the literal notes that go onto the page. It's a really good skill to develop, however, to be able to navigate those situations without falling into complete despair. Knowing that sometimes you just gotta do what you gotta do really, really helps in these circumstances. I'll also say that while I drew up the two situations with a teacher deadline and a commission deadline as having very different consequences, sometimes it doesn't feel that way. Sometimes that email to your teacher or simply showing up to a lesson empty-handed can feel immensely disappointing, which brings me to my third point in this category, which is that sometimes you just feel like you need to write because you're trying to hold yourself to something. Sometimes this can be a healthy practice, but if you're sacrificing your mental health for the sake of production, then it's just simply not worth it. I confided in a close friend of mine in late 2020 that I hadn't felt creative energy for music composition in quite a long time and was only writing to meet commission deadlines. I mentioned that I would frequently think of musical ideas, but never be able to muster the energy to write them down or develop them in any way. I was terrified that I would lose that spark forever and that just imagining musical ideas would be enough for me. It was a really scary period of time, obviously for a multitude of reasons, but being on the other end of that, let me just say that sometimes you really just need to not write music. For the entire year of 2021, I didn't write a single piece start to finish. I finished one piece that I had started in 2020, my oboe sonata, and worked a bit on a piece that I started in 2019, the symphony number two that I'm actually going to talk about in the final portion of this video. I'm really happy that I went through that actually and didn't force myself to write things very often because I don't think that would have been a positive use of creative energy. I finally had an opportunity to decompress and reassess what I was doing in life and I'm really grateful for that opportunity. Okay, so before the final portion of this video, I'd like to talk a bit about writing music that serves to complement an already extant piece of art or experience or incidental music and the ways in which it has its own dichotomy of creativity and, well, not that. Okay, so what the hell does that mean? If music is written for a work that already exists, such as a play, ballet, movie, video game, if it's meant to reflect a piece of visual art, or even if it's literally meant to emulate something inside the composer, like an experience, emotion, religious belief, political opinion, something they've seen, something they've done, it can be really difficult for the music to divorce itself from whatever that thing is. Unless the music exists in complete abstraction, it's impossible to consider it to be 100% creative because the music was, at least in some part, molded by whatever it is that it's meant to accompany or be inspired by. It's music that pertains to something else. The movie Star Wars at one point existed without music, but the music of Star Wars never existed without the movie, and the influence of the non-musical elements of the movie has an undeniable influence on the music. That's kind of the point. So there are many elements of the music that were dictated by what's happening on screen, and I would say that that is inherently not creative. The creativity exists within how John Williams made decisions in the face of these immutable elements of the movie. Decisions like when to include and not to include music, or deciding what kind of themes best suit different characters, or how to represent the inner thoughts and feelings of those characters through the use of leitmotif, and so much more. I think this is a good point for me to give the reminder that I don't think that any of this is inherently good or bad. We are all shaped by our own experiences and the art that we each individually have consumed over the course of our lives. To me, the purely creative aspects of composition 
position as well as the more utilitarian situations that we tend to be put in create a really fascinating dichotomy, one that for me is really interesting to think about where I exist on it. And if you don't mind, I would like to finally share an anecdote that inspired a piece that really got me thinking about this. In March of 2019, I took a week-long trip to London for spring break, and while I was there, I took a day trip down to Dover. You know, the one with the cliffs. I got there in the late morning after I had hopped the barrier to get onto the train because I couldn't understand how the ticket systems worked, and it was the most beautifully overcast day. It was just an absolutely immaculate vibe for me. It's worth mentioning that I did not go to Dover with the intent of writing music about the trip, I just wanted to see an English city outside of London because I really hadn't seen very much of that before. In any case, my family that I was staying with at the time had suggested to me that I visit Dover Castle, so that was my first destination, but even just walking through the town to get there was such a marvelous experience and it really stuck with me. The castle was really interesting too. Being American, I don't ever see buildings that are more than a few hundred years old, so something built nearly a thousand years ago was pretty special to see. I then failed to realize that there was a size difference between between British pints and American pints, and after finishing lunch in a pub more tipsily than intended, I made my way up to the cliffs, and this was the, the real kicker. I don't know how common of an experience this is because this is the single time this has ever happened to me, but seeing the immensity of the cliffs with endless rolling green hills to my left and the amazing expanse of blue to my right, I literally had tears running down my face. There was music in this place without me having written any, but I just couldn't help myself. So after wrapping up my symphony number one and letting these experiences and my musical ideas for them bubble for a few months, I started working on my symphony number two, subtitled Souvenir from Dover. I had three solidly programmatic and literal experiences to draw music out of. My initial walk through the town and my first experience seeing it, my trip to the castle, and my experience at the cliffs. Okay, great, that can be three movements, let's just start and see what happens. All of the musical preparation for this, by the way, was entirely mental. Nothing was written anywhere, and I didn't plan anything out super explicitly other than things I would revisit in my head. So when I started writing in Sibelius, all of these different ideas just sort of exploded into the document with a sort of I'll figure it out later attitude. And once I developed my ideas into chunks of music that resembled movements, or at least could be considered to be the basis of movements, I had the somewhat demoralizing realization that these main three extra musical ideas that I had had all manifested in slow to moderately paced music. None of them had taken the form of fast music. So why was this a problem? Why not just have a three-movement symphony that contains no fast music? Why does there need to be fast music? Well, of course it's not universal that a 15-minute work needs to have fast music in order to be considered good, whatever that is. But when listening through these three movements that I had written, while I loved each of them individually, it was kind of an exhausting listen. For this particular piece, I needed to diversify the energy a lot more. And so the challenge for me was, how do I drastically change objective things about the work while maintaining its authenticity? And so you can start to see how this story fits into this video. I decided that the Cliffs movement would be the last movement, that was the most cathartic of the experiences that I had had, and I think its general immensity made it an appropriate close to the symphony. Meanwhile, the Walk Through Town movement and the Dover Castle movement went together as a pair really nicely, so those stayed as the first two. Uh, okay, so what happened between the castle and the Cliffs? I accidentally got slightly drunk in a pub and then wandered around and trudged up a really long road to get to the Cliffs. Hmm doesn't exactly strike you as fast music content, does it? I tried so many times to write this movement or at least decide what it should be about because I was so hellbent on maintaining the authenticity and programmatic nature of the work. It seemed like a cheat to just make something up. I thought about this off and on for nearly two years, literally having all but one movement pretty much completed of the symphony. And no matter how many times I tried, it always felt fabricated. Finally, in February of 21, I said to myself that I should just remember the experience of the trip remember what it looked like and what it sounded like and what it felt like. Remember what I was thinking throughout the entire day. And from there, just write music that happens to be fast. And the result was the third movement that succeeded. I wrote music that both felt like it worked from a musical standpoint and was authentic to the experience that I had had. It captured the vibe. And ironically, in my attempt to uncreatively adhere to traditional music structures that I was familiar with, I did some of my most creative writing. The fact that it was inspired by a broader experience rather than a specific moment or emotion or thought allowed me to write largely in abstraction. I think that's exactly what I want. Okay, so what is the point of that story? Well, from my point of view, it's fascinating to think on just how upsetting I found creative inconsistency within one work to be. So much so that it made it so that I took almost three years to write a piece. 
piece. And it's somewhat liberating from just a standpoint of how I approach composition to know that not everything has to be the same degree of creative, and not everything has to be creative in the same way. My movements 1, 2, and 4 were creative not in their inception, but how they musically dealt with certain moments and feelings and sights, whereas my movement 3 was the reverse. So does the undeniable presence of these various uncreative things in our everyday work mean that we have to drastically pivot to make sure that we're being entirely creative 100% of the time? No, of course not. I hope I've made it plainly clear that that is absolutely not my belief. While many of these things are to the detriment of our craft, such as the music theory problem, I think a lot of them serve to keep it alive. It's impossible to be 100% innovative, and even if it were something that humans were capable of, I don't think that that's something we would even want. Art is a beautiful balance of creativity and calculation, and it's also worth mentioning that many artists really enjoy leaning much more on some of the tried and true processes of making music. While I do like to periodically add new things to my tool belt as a composer and try something unfamiliar and maybe even uncomfortable, I know that I like to live in a particular style that has some semblance of consistency to it. It took a lot of work and learning to even get to the point where I felt like I had a style or a flavor or color. I don't want to dilute that by feeling that I always have to be pushing the envelope. But that's my perspective. What I want to know is what you think about all this and how it relates to your creativity. What aspects of tradition do you like to keep around for yourself, and in what ways have you tried branching out in ways that either you've never tried or to your knowledge that no one has tried before. I'd love to hear your thoughts down below and if you think this video deserved a like I'd very much appreciate it as well as a click on that subscribe button if you'd like to hear more ramblings about music and art and stuff. Thanks very much for watching and I'll see you next time.